Hi, Sorry. everybody. Uh, my name's Scott Pavel. I'm the co-host of this who's going to bow out in just about three seconds after I finish this. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Bryn Dentinger, who is basically the world expert on the Boletus edulis group. Um, what we've done here is gotten a dozen of the best field experts, field identifiers in the country, and asked them to compile a list of all the questions about that group that have been driving them crazy. And Dr. Dentinger was then asked to explain all those questions to them. So if a lot of this goes over your head, I promise you a lot of it's going to go over my head. It's essentially aimed at you know, a, a 301 or 401 class. We have promised he does not have to teach any freshmen. Um, it will be, this is being recorded. It will go up on YouTube at some point in time once we get the links done. And I hope you all enjoy it as much as I'm hoping to. Grin, it's all yours. I'm going on mute. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, well, this is quite a showing. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to see some faces of names that I've corresponded with um, and many new faces out there. I hope to meet all of you in person one day soon. Um, I, I didn't want this to be very formal, but what I did is I just prepared a kind of short presentation um, that I thought would, I think, answer many of the questions that were sent to me. And then I thought um, there should be plenty of time to just have a conversation. And I'm hoping to learn as much or more from you than you are from me. So let me just get started. If I can find my screen. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Okay, so I need to move this window out of the way. All right, so um, kind of the motivation behind all this work that I've been doing sort of slowly over the years is um, this this juxtaposition in the Bolites that I think probably most of you are already familiar with, which is um, exemplified here with Boletus edulis, where there's just tremendous variation in the morphology, the gross morphology, the, the macro morphology, such as all of these varieties that you see here. Um, and there's, of course, more than that. And at the same time, there's a lot of what we call convergence where uh, features are really similar between two really distantly related taxa. So this is maybe a trivial, trivial example for field mycologists because of course you'd be able to distinguish between Tylopolis phileus and Boletus phariopes in the field. But um, I think the point here is that this is a confusing situation that when you start to look at the diversity um, it just becomes really incomprehensible, at least to me, it has. So that's kind of what's motivated me um, to pursue this group. And of course, traditionally, uh, the Boletaceae were classified by morphology, and micromorphology in particular has been used by extensively by a number of different groups. Um, so basidiomor basidiospore morphology, uh, was used in the 80s, um, and still today, of course, it's an important feature. Uh, um, <clears throat> the trauma anatomy of the tubes was used for a long time um, to divide. There are two major types, boletoid and phyloporoid types of trauma. And of course, the presence, shape, color, that kind of thing of cystidia. And then secondary metabolites have also been used to classify um, the boletes. Um, more at the ordinal level than at the family level, but nonetheless, secondary metabolite chemistry has been important. But none of these none of these characters have really um, given us a natural classification. And of course, because of what I just showed you, that great variation uh, juxtaposed with um, convergence makes it really difficult to sort through the importance of these characters and and um, 
which characters are really truly useful for classification. So people turn to molecular phylogenetics, as you probably are all aware. Um, and this has really taken mycology by storm, and it's really the, you know, the, the, the main way that we classify fungi these days. And this is just a short history, a non-comprehensive short history of the attempts to resolve the Bolitaceae family tree. So here's one of the earliest phylogenies from 2001. Um, and here they recognized um, at that point that the Bolitaceae, the family at the family level, had really undergone a, a radiation. Um, and that, those are those groups, radiations are particularly problematic for reconstructing relationships because the period of time in which those um, features are recorded is so short that there are so few features that um, are actually that we can actually use to reconstruct the the relationships. Um, as time went on, people started to look um, to try to add more genes um, to get better resolution, more taxa, um, including myself. Here's a three gene phylogeny from 2010. Um, but nonetheless, even with more genes and bigger trees and more colors, people still could not get the backbone to resolve. That is the relationships amongst those different lineages, say genera or what you might call them, has been frustratingly difficult to resolve. Um, so difficult, in fact, that uh, a member of my PhD committee told me that it was an insurmountable obstacle and I should have studied birds instead, which I didn't appreciate. But <laughs> um, so the problem here is that um, it, without a backbone, we can't, we can't um, achieve a natural classification. We can't test hypotheses about their evolution, such as trait evolution or biogeography. Um, and really the issue here is that these radiations, because of the, the very little recorded uh, history, um, this results in something known as uh, um, incomplete lineage sorting amongst genes. And you don't need to know what that means, except that it interferes with our ability to infer uh, relationships correctly. Um, and one of the consequences of this has been this explosion of generic names. So because the boundaries between the clades were not clear, the relationships amongst those clades were not determined, the uh, default has been for people to describe each one of those clades as a distinct genus. And so this is a chart showing this is just up till two, uh, well, I can't remember. Um, there's even more. Like I can't. I don't know about you, but I personally can't feel like I can't keep up with all the new genera being, dis being described in the Bolitaceae. And you can see it's just been exponential, um, with 52 of them since uh, 2010. And, and I think what's really illustrative of the problem here is that 20 of those, so almost half of those new genera, are monotypic. And the logical conclusion of naming every clade as its own genus is that we're just gonna end up with a bunch of monotypic genera. Um, and to me, that's not a very satisfying um, classification. Okay. So um, are there potential solutions to this problem? Well, yes, there are. One is of course, more sequence data, um, more representative taxon sampling. And by that, I mean more geographic representation as well as taxonomic representation. Many, most of the previous um, studies have been biased towards North American and European taxa or Asian taxa, and there hasn't been a very good global uh, sampling in a single study yet. So um, that and that could be really important to resolving some of these relationships. And then the third part is a sort of a technical or analytical approach where we can actually attempt to account for that incomplete lineage sorting problem using some special techniques. And I don't talk in, I'm not gonna talk about any of the, the details here, but I'm happy to talk about it if anybody's interested. Okay, and so just as an illustration of um, some of the problems we face, this is a great example of um, incomplete lineage sorting or um, just uh, the lack of markers, lack of um, changes available for us to infer relationships. Um, two popular markers in the past that were used are the ATP6 gene from the mitochondrial genome and the large subunit of the ribosome. And 
Here are two phylo phylogenies from my 2010 paper that show that Porcini or Boletus sensu stricto, which are the taxa in red, are not recovered as monophyletic with either of those two genes. So it took a different gene, which has more information in it than the other two, RPB1 in this case, to resolve that group as monophyletic, which um, was the first time it was actually resolved as monophyletic in a molecular phylogenetic study. Uh, and then when you combine them together, you can get greater resolution. But notice again, still, we have very poor support on the backbone. So when you don't see a number, that means it was not statistically significant. So that's really what we are trying to target here is this, this the backbone of the tree. Okay, so um, one of the motivations for our approach here is that because fungi have, on average, small genomes relative to other eukaryotes like animals or plants, it's actually quite feasible and economic, roughly speaking, at least in modern today's type of science, to um, generate whole genomes for, for many different species. So that's what we did. We set out to sample um, as broadly as we could. Uh, we enlisted the help of Roy, who's on here. Uh, he, he provided many specimens for this study. Uh, Terry Hinkle provided many specimens. Um, I provided some of my own specimens for my own collecting. And then uh, we also sampled from other um, museum collections to flesh out the, the sampling a bit. So in total, we had 245 specimens. This is the, um, uh, you can see the geographic breakdown of the specimens. Here you can see I've, um, <laughs> I guess I have the opposite problem here where I don't have enough representation from Europe. <laughs> um, but we're, we're getting there. We're, we're solving that problem currently. Um, and then what we do is we, we use this technique called shotgun sequencing. And what that is, is we just sequence all of the DNA that's present without um, targeting any particular region. So we just we just sequence the whole thing. Um, it's called shotgun because people visualize it as if it's a spray of, you know, it's a crude kind of spray of BBs or whatever. Um, and then we try to sequence enough that we have um, 25 to 50 X coverage. And what that means is that for any one position in the genome, we have us, we have 25 to 50 sequences at that position. Um, and that's that's how we um, can be confident that we're not encountering technical errors with the sequencing. So then we take those um, shotgun sequences and we have to assemble them. So we have to stitch them back together. And this is a non-trivial issue because the methods that we use to sequence currently only sequence 150 nucleotides at a time, which if you're familiar with uh, ITS barcoding, as many of you I think have been involved with, recently, you know, you can sequence um, 500 nucleotides at a time with that method. So this approach is much more limited in the length that you get. And, and that translates into um, uh, much more computational complexity when you try to stitch them back together. So that's a big, a big um, bottleneck in this process is this assembly part. Once we have the assembly, so we have the long fragments of sequence, we can then go in and extract what are called orthologs. So these would be the same gene across all species. And we pick orthologs based on different criteria. Um, and I don't recall if I explained that a bit, but if you wanna ask about that uh, later, I'm happy to explain that. From there, we go on to phylogenetic inference. Um, so that's a standard approach that people have been using for decades with single or few genes, but here we're now um, scaling that up to hundreds or thousands of genes. Okay, so that's the, that's the I'm not going to talk any more about that. Um, I'm going to show you our results. And this is the tree, the tree that we got, and I, I know that you can't read it. <laughs> so don't worry, I've, I've magnified sections of the tree that you'll see in just a second. So this is the 245 um, taxa. Uh, we used about 1,300 genes. And I won't explain how we got this tree, but it took a lot of time. <laughs> and so I'm gonna just show you the tree in three sections. Whoops. 
hold on. <laughs> I didn't want, I thought I covered all that up. Shoot. Well, okay. <laughs> Just bear with me here. Oh, I know why. Okay, all that Gen Nove stuff, which is genus Novum, ignore that, please. Okay, we are in the process of figuring out how we're going to carve out the genera. And so this is not at all, um, this is not at all a final <laughs> classification. Um, I, I covered these up and, and PowerPoint's got the best of me. So my apologies, but um, uh, yeah, what do I want to say about that? So we, we're working on getting the, the genera um, described, but this, this was, I actually purposely was, um, I was trying to goad <laughs> Roy into, into looking at this tree. And so I put a bunch of gen novums, uh, on there thinking that he would, that would get his reaction. So, um, just ignore those, but the, the named genera here, these are good genera, I think. Um, and you can see, I know one of the questions, uh, that was posed was how close, Xanthoconium is to Boletus, and you can see here that they're not too far away from each other on the tree, but they are not each other's closest relatives. There's some stuff in between. Um, and Boletus is uh, monophyletic, monophyletic, like uh, was shown previously. And I'll show you um, more about Boletus in a second. Okay, so in the middle part of the tree, uh, we have these genera. Um, and again, just ignore the gen novums. Um, I even picked some genera um, purposely just to sort of scare people, Roy in particular, <laughs> to get his, um, get his response on these things. So don't, don't um, man, I'm just like giving lots of caveats about the genera here. Just don't worry about the genera at the moment. Um, but basically uh, what you can what I want you to know is that all of these nodes here, every single node on the backbone of the tree received um, significant statistical support. So we know we are very confident in the relationships that we are depicting in this tree, which is really the first time that um, anybody's been able to show many of these relationships with, with true statistical statistical support. Okay, and then the third part of the tree is down at the bottom here. Um, this is the one where apparently it worked for my blocking out those gen novum things. Um, and you can see the earliest diverging group, which has been shown previously, is Chalciporus and Buchwaldo boletus. We don't have Buchwaldo boletus in this tree, but it is in there. Um, and it's in its sister to Chalciporus. So there's a couple of groups down there. That's the earliest diverging group. Uh, and then we have some stuff down here that I called Wakefieldia because that's the oldest name in Wakefieldia that the uh, um, Hypogeus um, uh, bully is in that clade, along with a bunch of other stuff. So don't you know? Don't get married to that name. It probably won't <laughs> be the the name that's chosen in the end. Okay, so I'm just zipping past these things. I'm happy to go back and talk about those with you later if anybody wants to. Okay, so I wanted to now focus just on Porcini. So this is the Porcini clade, um, Boletus sensu stricto. And I uh, just wanted to show you that the closest relative so far, um, well, actually there's some closer things, but this thing is rather close, this Xerocomus aliaceus. This is what it looks like. We collected this in Cameroon, um, and it smells very strongly of garlic. And it has some kind of features that I'm now beginning to interpret as sort of um, ancestral Porcini characters. And that's due to knowing about some other things that are also early diverging lineages within the Porcini group. Um, there now seems to be a set of sort of proto-type characters, which is really fun to, to see that finally. Um, and then down here, the, the, there's this new early diverging lineage that was um, sent to me by Ron Pastorino. I don't know if you're on here. Um, and I'll talk more about that one later. But this is a very exciting find. Um, this is from Texas. It's a North American species that is currently unnamed, um, but it looks like it's one of the oldest lineages of Porcini. So that's quite exciting. Okay. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and talk um, about Porcini and understanding the species complexes 
and, and specifically this Boletus edulis species complex. So Boletus edulis um, is a widespread species. It has a native distribution across the Northern hemisphere. Um, it's found from sea level to subalpine and tundra habitats. So it's got this really huge ecological amplitude. And as many of you know, also a tremendous amount of morphological variation. Um, and it's also found as a uh, ectomycorrhizal mutualist with um, every known host uh, tree, at least at the, at the genus level. Although there are differences in host associations across its range. And I'll, I'll mention that in a bit. The other cool thing about Boletus edulis is it's been introduced um, inadvertently in a number of places where it's not native. And that allows us to ask um, really interesting questions about uh, some of the genetics and, and um, the timing of some of the genetic patterns that we see. So this is something we haven't um, explored fully yet, but we are getting specimens sequenced from some of these non-native introductions so that we can we can start asking questions about um, how quickly um, mutations arise and that kind of thing. Okay, so um, one of the things that has been a problem in Boletus edulis is that the ITS does not resolve the morphological groups or even the geographic lineages, potential geographic lineages that people have um, described in the past. And this is an example from our publication in 2020, where we show, um, although there is some clustering, you know, these uh, lines, colored lines show you the geographic origins. There's some indication that there's clustering at geographic, um, based on geography, it's not consistent between two genes. So basically the information content in ITS, as well as EF1 alpha are just not sufficient to sort out the groups. Um, and I should also say one, one problem in the, that's, that's really, um, one thing that's really been a problem in the past with uh, dividing Boletus edulis up, in, and in fact, this would apply to any other species on the planet, is uh, when you don't, when you take from um, the extreme ends of the range, but not intervening regions, you can miss the variation that links them. So if you can imagine um, you've got blue over here and uh, red over here, and you think, oh, well, this one's blue and this one's red. But if you actually sample in between, you might find that it, this blue slowly becomes more um, red as you move along and the red moves towards blue in the other direction. And so if you're not sampling that middle part of the variation, you're going to get you're going to be misled into thinking you have two distinct things. OK, so that's been a big problem. But what this really tells us is that Boletus edulis is somewhere in the process of either forming new species or having just formed new species, or maybe uh, new species are coming back together and, and merging into one. So it's somewhere in this, this process, this is a, uh, a schematic by Kevin DeCaraz when he was talking about how species form, and he's got these stages of speciation where um, at the early stages, these two lineages here are kind of leaky. And so you might have patterns like this, even though really the trajectories of those two lineages are, are, are towards having distinct groups, but it just hasn't been long enough for those two groups to form, um, to, to become distinct. So this is why we are really interested in Boletus edulis because this provides us kind of the perfect model for understanding how species form in the Boletaceae, and we think also it's a good model for understanding how species form in the fungi in general. So, um, what we did, um, and this paper actually just was just published today, <laughs> is we gathered 160 specimens, um, mostly from um, institutions around the world, and then we did whole genome sequencing of every one of those 160 specimens. And these are all Boletus edulis. And <clears throat> we first generated a reference genome, which you have to do if you really want to, to um, work with high quality data. 
So we did that from this specimen here, which comes from Utah. Um, and then we called variants. So this would just be individual differences across the genome between any two individual mushrooms. And in total, we had 790,000 of those variants. So that's a lot of data. That means we can really draw robust conclusions um, based on some of those patterns. And so first of all, what I'll show you is a phylogeny of Boletus edulis. These are the 160 specimens plus a few others, some outgroups. Um, and the colors indicate distinct geographic lineages that we were able to um, infer. So you can see here, we've got um, six geographic lineages and they are pretty well separated on the map. And that's indicated here on the bottom. Now you might be wondering about this yellow one here. So this is what we're calling the European genotype when it's yellow. Um, and this is almost certainly, although we can't prove it, but it's almost certainly an introduction of a European genotype into Eastern North America. This collection was made underneath a Norway spruce tree, which is of course a European species of tree that's been planted extensively throughout Eastern North America. So we think that's that explains that the presence of that European genotype, because otherwise there's a very distinct Eastern North American genotype here depicted in orange. Um, another way to visualize these genotypes is in this plot. So every line, every bar here represents an individual, and the colors represent the amount of the genome that comes from these lineages. So the first thing I'll point out is that many in, of the individuals are pretty much uniform in their genome in terms of the lineage. So there's very strong geographic lineage cohesiveness. Um, although there are still individuals you'll see, like this individual right here, which has portions of the genomes from all of the lineages. So we call this an admixed individual. So that tells us that there is gene flow and interbreeding going on between these lineages. Okay, that's not the only measure, however, of interbreeding. And so we have another measure of that, which is here. And all you need to know is that the measure of interbreeding between all of these comparisons is quite high. So we were able to detect um, active gene flow, active um, reproductive reproduction between all of these lineages, some more than others, but um, these are all quite, quite high rates. So taken together, what this really tells us is that Bilides edulis has very distinct genetic lineages that are geographically distributed but there's also ongoing gene flow. And so our conclusion was that what's happening is Boletus edulis is undergoing local adaptation, and that's what's maintaining the genetic distinctive distinctiveness in these different geographic regions um, in the face of gene flow. So we didn't, we didn't um, tackle this question in our study. We were um, purposely being agnostic about the taxonomy here. But um, given that we see this population differentiation, but high levels of gene flow, our current opinion is that we're really looking at one species, um, or at least oh. it's, it's early enough in um, the speciation process that uh, we don't feel the need to divide it into multiple species. But of course, this is an, opi an opinion, and I'd love to hear what you think about this. Okay. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit now, which is getting towards um, how we can actually apply names accurately to these species. And of course, the only way you can do that is if you know um, what the type represents. That is the specimen that was designated at the time the species was described. If you know how that relates to modern collections, then you can apply names accurately. Um, of course, we rely heavily on DNA sequencing um, now because, as many of you probably are familiar with, the morphology in Porcini and many other groups is just so confusing that it's really hard to 
know how to apply names with any level of confidence. Certainly, that's the case for me. Um, and so the problem, uh, however, is that a lot of the types are, are old. Um, they were described back in the early 20th century or late 19th century. And the material is in very poor shape. Um, there's very little of it. And um, people in the past have attempted to extract DNA and have not been successful, or at least they haven't been successful with being able to amplify genes of interest. And there's a reason why, and I'll show you that in a second. So, um, but what we did is we decided to take these new whole genome sequencing techniques, which don't rely on having intact DNA to begin with, and applied that to all of these types that you can see here. Um, we focused on the PEC types of Porcini in particular, because there are a number of names that PEC applied that um, I have not been confident in knowing how to apply um, ever. <laughs> Um, and then there's some additional types that I was very interested in for global porcini, such as um, some species uh, from Asia um, and elsewhere. So uh, I'll just point out that the oldest um, specimen we sequenced here is was 173 years old. It was collected by Hooker in Sikkim, India in 1849. And it's the type of the species Boletus gigas, uh, which had been referred to the edulis group in the past. So that was one name that was floating out there that nobody knew how to apply to modern material. And I wanted to know what it was. Okay, so um, the problem that uh, people have faced in the past, and the reason that you can't amplify genes like ITS from this old material is that the DNA is broken up into such small pieces that they're much smaller than the region that you would try to amplify. And so it doesn't work, the amplification fails. So as an example here, this is a plot showing you the, the frequency of fragments of a certain size from a G DNA extraction from this specimen here. This is what is has been thought to be the holotype of Boletus edulis var clavipes PEC. Unfortunately, PEC didn't designate a holotype for this species, and so it's hard to know if this is the correct collection or not. However, um, and this is this is what all of those old specimens look like, the DNA, the average size is 58 base pairs. So this is what, um, um, you know, preserved woolly mammoth DNA looks like. This is kind of what we're dealing with. It's, it's really ancient DNA. So this is a big challenge, um, a technical challenge in a number of ways. The other thing is that um, a lot of these specimens have have other stuff on them, molds, um, DNA from all kinds of things, because they've been sitting around in a cabinet for 173 years and maybe not cared for so well in the first half of that life. So they accumulate a lot of things over time. And here's an example. This is a plot. Um, it's going to have lots of dots, colored dots on it. And what it's showing you is DNA that comes from different organisms in the, in the sample from Boletus edulis var clavipes peck. So first of all, we did find fungi, and that's always very encouraging when you find fungi. <laughs> um, and they were Basidiomycota and, of course, Ascomycota. We also found a lot of bacteria, which was not terribly surprising to us. We also found animal DNA, chordata. This could be human DNA. It could be mouse DNA. could be anything with a vertebra. Um, and of course, we found arthropod DNA. And this is a well-known lasioderma. We were able to identify it. This is a well-known uh, pest of herbaria. And then there is stuff that we couldn't identify, including um, a large percentage that is this gray cloud here. And that is probably due to the fact that the reference databases that we're using to identify these are just vast, vastly incomplete. And so if there's nothing in the reference database that matches it, the result that's returned to us is no hit. So much of this up here is probably from the specimen itself because there is no reference genome for this. Uh, this is likely to be from that um, specimen. Okay. Now, I, this is a technical thing, um, but I thought it 
might be interesting to share it, maybe not, I don't know, but <laughs> there's two, um, two types of DNA that you can get out of samples. The typical type that's found in your cells right now is called double-stranded DNA. That's when both strands are, are matching to each other and they wrap around in that double helix fashion, you know, everybody's seen that. And that's the typical type of DNA that people target. Um, but then there's what's called single-stranded DNA. And that's when those two strands are separated and you just have one floating around. And there's um, theoretical and empirical evidence to suggest that old degraded specimens, at least really old samples like woolly mammoths, um, more of the DNA from the mammoth is in a single stranded form than in double stranded form. So we wanted to know if that was also the case for our old mushroom specimens. And so we, we also sequenced single stranded DNA. And the good news is um, we get rid of a lot of the contaminant DNA when we enrich just for single stranded DNA. So here you can see that virtually all of the DNA we got is probably from the target organism. The problem is um, when we actually started to analyze these data, it turns out that the, um, the, the representation of the genome in the single-stranded DNA is really inadequate. It's really a biased set of sequences. And so even though there's less contamination, it turns out that double-stranded DNA is a better approach. Um, we get more usable data from it. Okay, so once we get the double-stranded DNA, we can then fish out um, genes of interest. So we can go in and, and take them out and, um, and analyze them. And so here are, this is all ITS. I'm, I'm just gonna show you ITS sequences, although we're able to get other genes out of these. Um, and here you can see that Boletus gigas uh, the ITS of that clusters with le lexinum. So it's definitely not in Porcini. And then one of Peck's names, um, Boletus multipunctus, which he had referred to uh, the Porcini group, it turns out it is also not uh, a member of the Porcini group. Um, here it is um, found with some red pored uh, species. Okay, so. Um, We've been able to get sequences from types for 32 species of porcini. Um, 13 uh, of the remaining 21 species of porcini are new species. Um, and so they don't have type types designated yet. Um, four don't have physical types. These are the four European species. Um, as far as I know, epitypes have not been designated, so the types still remain as um, paintings only. But Europe only has four species. It's very simple, so not a problem. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> eight names were newly fixed. So this is all based on PEX, um, mostly on PEX types. We were able to apply those names now for the first time. So I'm going to show you those. This is the real tree. Um, this is based on 154 sequences, uh, and 32 of them are types. And these are the species as I recognize them today. Um, and I'm not going to march through this. Uh, we can go back and talk about different groups if you want. But I've got some more information for you that I think is probably more going to directly answer your questions about what to call things than just looking at this tree. So um, based on our analysis of type ITS sequences um, and all of the unpublished ITS sequences of Porcini that I have, these are the named North American species. And I emphasize named because um, you'll see in a second that there's still some unnamed species out there. So first of all, Boletus edulis, um, these are, we consider this one species. So these would be, all of these would be synonyms under that concept. Holy fuck. <laughs> um, okay, uh, oh. this was a surprise to me. Uh, Boletus variopes turns out um, it's identical with Boletus nobilissimus. Boletus frustulosus is an old name for what has been called Boletus pseudopinophilus recently. Boletus Marie exists, and in fact, it's the same as Boletus reginius. 
There's something interesting with this one that I can talk about. Um, I had this result when I was doing my PhD, but I didn't believe it. So I didn't publish it. Um, and it's taken me 20 years <laughs> to convince myself that this is real. And it is. It is true. Absolutely 100% convinced. Belize barosii, a very good species. Very interesting distribution. Um, it's got a, a, a disjunct distribution um, and a host shift with that which is quite interesting, but just looking at ITS, at least from those two regions, they are the same, but that, you know, I think that might be another case where there's probably differentiation, um, much more recent differentiation than we can uh, observe in ITS alone. Belitis subserial lessons um, is the same as what Dick and Snell were calling subspecies subserial lessons and subspecies Orantio ruber. Uh, and this, um, is confirmed by sequencing, of course, but um, I, I've had a number of encounters with subserial lessons, and the bluing reaction is really variable, and I think that explains why um, Dick and Snell uh, recognized this Orantia ruber. It was just a um, an individual that didn't have that strong bluing reaction. Bletus rex veris is a good species. Bletus subalpinus is a good species. Belitis leptocephalus is what Peck called what people today recognize as Belitis varieties. So that's an old name that nobody knew how to apply it. And the type sequence is identical with what everybody else calls Belitis varieties. Belitis varieties var fagicola is a good species, but it needs a new name because it's not a variety of varieties. Um, some people do collect something that they call Atkinsonii, that is this species, but Atkinsonii is also a good species. It may be conspecific with Belitis occidentalis, but um, further research is needed on that. Belitis fibrillosis is a good species. And then finally, the other, the Allobelitis group, if you will, Belitis separans, um, <clears throat> there's multiple species here and I'll show you a tree in a second. The type is not sequenced. We did not include that in our sampling. I don't know why, <laughs> an oversight. So we, we will request that and get that sequenced because I think it's important. Um, and then Belitis nobilis um, is synonymous with Belitis gertrudiae. Okay, these are the named species. But there are five species in North America that are new and do not have names. And these are the five right here. So this one is um, known only from a few collections in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And it has been named as Boletus Madie, but it is not Boletus Madie. It is something new and needs to be described. And I've never encountered it in the field. So this is um, for any of those, for any of the, you living in the Rockies, especially in Colorado, this is a species I, I really want to have more samples of. Um, this is a new species from the Southern US, the Gulf Coast area, uh, probably extends into Texas and may, it may go further south into Mexico, um, Guatemala. I was collecting in Mexico and Guatemala this past summer. And there's a lot of things down there around the Atkinsonii complex, which this is appears to be part of, morphologically speaking. So this is a new species that I, um, Juan Mata at uh, University of Alabama, I know, had a student that was going to describe it at one point. And I don't think that's happened. Um, I haven't seen it anyway. So this will be a new one that needs to be described by somebody. This is a new one that came um, from one of you. I, I don't know, Ava, if you're out there, but um, you sent this to us. We, we solicited a lot of collections from many of you and you sent us great, amazing things, including new species. So um, this one, uh, I can't remember which, which one it is, I'm sorry, um, on the tree. Um, and then this one collected by Ron uh, Pastorino, this is uh, very exciting. I think there's another collection of this um, that we haven't sequenced, but I think I've seen it on Mushroom Observer. But this is a very exciting one because of its position way down at the base of 
the tree. So this looks like a very ancient lineage. And that's really important for us to understand the, the biogeography of Porcini. And then this one that was sent by Igor, um, this is the second um, separans that we have. And um, I had made a collection of this back in 2003. So I already had a sequence of this. Um, and we don't know if this is Peck separans or maybe this is pseudo separans um, or maybe it's something entirely different. So I, I will be targeting the types of separans and pseudo separans to try to sort this out in the future. Okay, and I just wanted to, to point out that these are citizen science contributions. I think maybe all of you are in the audience, which would be wonderful. Um, so thank you. This is this is a hugely important part of this task because who can be out um, collecting all the time? It's just impossible given how um, how you can't predict where things are ever going to be. So super important. Okay, um, I just thought for interest, there's a bunch of new species in Asia as well. So we know of six new species in Asia right now. There's probably more there. These are photos of those six. Um, a couple of these are collections that I made in Borneo, this one here and this one here. Um, this one also is from Borneo and our current tree of 4,000 taxa with three genes, which I'm not showing you today, um, places this as the earliest diverging lineage of Porcini. So it's it's the first thing. Well, actually you can see it right here but it's actually outside of all of these in the new tree. So this is a very exciting sample for us. And then <clears throat> this one comes from Thailand. This comes from Peninsular Malaysia. And then this is a very exciting discovery from Taiwan um, that was made a um, few years ago. I, I believe this is the only collection of it and it was sent to us and we have a whole genome for it now, but look at the brilliant blue color. It's just spectacular. So again, um, really great contribution by citizen scientists. Okay, that's all I have for you um, with the presentation. So now I'm gonna stop sharing and then you can start asking me questions. Okay. Yeah, we have a, a couple of them that I've been trying to take notes on. Um, Bill Yule asked a question, is Belitis edulis a single biological species with 40 to 50 morpho variants, or is it more of a genetic swarm? Um, I think you were trying to answer this. This happened before you got down, but went over yeah. my. I think this this is really a case where it, my opinion is that it's it's best to call it one biological species right now. That doesn't mean it's not in the process of speciating and in. 20,000 years, we might have more than one species. But I think if we're going to just document and, and describe what we have in existence today, it would probably be most accurate to call it a single species. Are, are there morphological distinctions between all these that we can actually use in the field? Well, the problem is that the morphology is not correlated with the genetics. Oh. So, um, so no. <laughs> Oh, we got everybody. If you post questions, I'm looking, scanning through, looking for them. Um, yeah, Andy, gene flow. I'm sorry. Um, have export import practices over the last X hundred years mm. studied the waters of distinct speciation? Um, no. Oops. Uh. No, it doesn't appear to have done that. Um, so I don't think that the um, importing of say food, food porcini for food or um, accidentally through nursery stock is extensive enough to, to see it in any of the genomes that we've sequenced. That's not what we're seeing at present. Um, I just think the population, like we can calculate the population size of porcini um, using genetics and it's massive. It's, you know, there's so many individuals. So the small amount of introduction that humans have made in the last couple hundred years is so minuscule that it just won't, it won't show up in, 
in the genetics uh, pro probably ever. Okay. Um can you scan down these as well as I should, or should I keep? Yeah, well, a Andy Sorry. raised his hand. Why don't we let Andy um, ask his question? Oh, there it goes. Yeah, now I can unmute myself. Thanks, Bryn. Um, yeah, great talk. I missed your talk at Telluride, so I'm glad you're doing it this way. <laughs> uh, but 1,300 genes just to resolve the Volataceae. Um, my question is, in order to get broader participation and people who are interested in systematics of the Bolotaceae and resolving some of these questions and looking at some of these groups more in depth, do you plan on potentially examining which of those 1300 genes might be most informative so that you can have inclusion? Because a lot of researchers in other parts of the world, they can't do the genomics. They, they're stuck with like Sanger methods. So do you plan on potentially releasing the most informative genes for resolving the Bolote CE? Yes, we do. Um, so we're gonna provide, we're gonna rank the genes in terms of their informativeness. Um, and we're gonna also design PCR primers for those genes and test them to make sure that we have primers that are usable for people. And we're also gonna provide a, um, a backbone tree that people will be able to plug their sequences into um, and get an answer right away. So yeah, we're, we are cognizant of, of the accessibility issue and, and do, we're gonna do our best to make this as useful and usable for people uh, in the field as, as we can. If people have other ideas on what would be super useful, please let me know too, because we will happily do what we can to make this as usable as possible. There's actually a couple of questions here about what can we all do in the field if we're going to be out collecting things? What kind of documentation can we do that you and your peers are going to find and be able to, uh, to say, hey, send me that? Well, I, I mean, it's hard to say because we never know what you're going to encounter. And so like some of the, these five species that showed up, we there's no way we could have predicted that. So I would say, you know, one thing is if, if there's anything you see that looks really odd, <laughs> save it. And that's the kind of stuff we're looking for, for new diversity. Um, for edulous, we're really interested in getting as many more samples, especially from some of these regions that we don't have representation that might connect to groups. So for example, um, we don't have any samples from the boreal regions of central Canada. And that looks like it may be the uh, contact zone between the Eastern North American lineage and the Alaska lineage. And we really want samples from that region because it'll, it'll allow us to really um, determine if there's a hard boundary or if they're really mixing. I have a hunch you're about to get some. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, we would love it. We also, um, we also need stuff from Siberia. <laughs> We had plans to go uh, to Siberia next summer, um, but of course, with what's going on, we're no longer traveling to Russia. So we really, and it's really, it's been really hard for us to get samples from there, but um, it's interesting. The, the few samples we have look like the same genotype in, as exists in Alaska rather than the European genotype. And so that's another area that we're really focused on trying to get samples um, to try to, because if we can get that well represented, we'll be able to determine with much more confidence direction of migration. So right now, it looks, we think, like Europe was just recently colonized by Boletus edulis from Alaska. But our confidence in saying that is pretty low because we don't have samples from the intervening regions. Um, I believe Roy had asked a question in the writing. How do these species travel? I mean, how, how does something get yeah. from Alaska to Europe uh, in this climate? So we think that there's a combination of um, local dispersal mostly. So we see high, um, when you look at a local scale genetically, we see high inbreeding coefficients. Um, in fact, the inbreeding coefficients are higher than um kind of the the model like what what is it like um 
some of these species that are of animals that are going extinct because their population sizes are so small. Uh, we have inbreeding coefficients at local scales that are that are higher than some of those animals. And that suggests that there's very little um, long distance spore dispersal. But yeah, cheetahs, yeah, I just saw that pop up exactly. So, um, but what we think is happening is there's episodic long distance dispersal. So every so often a spore can make it a really long distance. And if it can establish, then that's just enough to kind of keep the gene flow happening, but at a low rate. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep asking questions, people, if nobody else is going to click. We've got, a hand, we've got a hand raised here. Hi there. Um, I was not trying to muddy the waters here, but um, I, I, I kind of am curious what value you, uh, we don't have any better alternatives, but what value is uh, speciation itself when you've got a pug and a greyhound that are considered the same species and you've got European and American mushrooms that are edulous that look almost identical for all practical purposes. Um, I don't know, I don't really know what I'm trying to ask, I guess. It's, it's, it's more of a question of, um, do you see any better alternatives and what boundaries do you put on your genetic sequencing as far as a uh, degree of differentiation where you would draw the line on a species. Yeah. What is a species? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's the greatest unanswerable question in science. Um, so a species is what you want it to be is basically the short answer. <laughs> um, Fair enough. <laughs> and everybody's going to have their own idea about it. So I, you know, I don't have strong opinions, frankly, about it. Um, if the community thinks that it's worth calling these five, six lineages, now seven that we've added stuff from Central America um, as distinct species, then by all means, let's do it. Um, from my perspective, you know, I can detect gene flow between all these groups. So I guess I'm, I was accused recently by um, Tim James as being a lumper. I guess I am. Um, I, I, I guess I just take a conservative view of, of species at this point. And so I don't, I personally don't see the need in dividing them up. Um, and I think by doing so, you lose information, biological information that's important, which is that these species are exchanging genes. And so there are other mechanisms at play that are causing them to maintain their distinctive identities, but it's not its not what you would traditionally think as species boundaries. Okay. Did I, punt that, no, did I punt that one far enough? <laughs> and there's no better substitute for speciation. So I guess it's just how finely you want to split the hairs and for scientific purposes, very useful for someone who's just, um, you know, foraging. Um, good to know, good to be familiar with, but um, and interesting. Definitely yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, yeah, I, I. You know, getting back to this case of Bolitus edulis and um, how we define it. I, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on morphological features. So, for example, I think probably the most the most obvious one for many people here is Bolitus rubriceps from southern Rockies. But we have that species, if you call it that, or that lineage in Utah, and in southern Utah, and um, you know I've seen morphologies down there that look exactly like morphologies I find in the northern part of the range, even though that's part of the Rubriceps lineage. And so I just don't think that the consistency of those morphologies is actually real enough to emphasize with the name. But that's just my personal opinion. Okay. Thanks very much. All right. Should we get some other? Who's next? I saw somebody had raised a hand, but I don't know how to do it. I see you 
business. Down at the bottom, there's a reaction button. And you can raise your hand if you click on that. Jim, do you have a question? There, now you can talk. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, Bryn, this is really revealing to me. But I haven't heard any mention from you so far of any um, sequestrate species related to edulis. Yeah, so we know about subalpinus, that's a secodioid species. Um, there was recently a, dis a species described from Australia that is sequestrate, that is in the Porcini group that I do not have material of at this time, but I have requested it, so I'm hoping to get it sequenced. Well, we'll we'll look for any in our collections, but I don't recall any that uh, were reminiscent of uh, Porcini. Um, uh, from North America, Suillus is a pretty prolific producer of sequestrate species, most of which have been put in other genera, but uh, need to go into Suillus, I'm sure. And uh, some other boletes, we have a beautiful one. It's a tiny little thing about an inch high, but with brilliant scarlet uh, pileus and brilliant yellow pores. But I have no idea where it belongs in the whole uh, uh, circus of Boletaceae. Another, That's great. Hmm? Excuse me? Oh, I was just, it's great. It's great to hear, yeah. Um, also, I'm happy that uh, Andy Wilson is here because he's doing a wonderful job that enables us to uh, separate out the sequestrate se uh, sclerogaster species. I think we have now uh, 30 or more, which seems rather unusual for a puffball, but uh, uh, Andy, by using similar techniques that you're using, uh, is getting it sorted out, and we'll find out how many misidentifications we have made uh, at the species level. But uh, he's doing a great job, and we're so happy that he was willing to uh, become the principal investigator of uh, this particular program. And, I think uh, we'll be getting something out in the next year or so. Wonderful. Yeah, to say a little bit more about the sequestrate taxa, Jim, we have a number of them in our whole genome phylogeny, I think a dozen. Um, and most of them represent independent origins of the sequestrate form. And we mm -hmm. thought that this was an opportunity to, to look for the genetic basis of it. Um, and we tried, but it turned it out, turned out to be way, way too complicated. So that <laughs> project's on the back burner at the moment, but we're still hoping we might be able to figure it out. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Annie Weisman wrote a question about stuffed pores. Is ah. it... well, uh, okay, where's the question? Um, is stuffed pores in Boletus sensu stricto versus flabope, the, the PHL word, an example of convergent evolution? Um, maybe. I, I mean, probably, I guess. Yeah, so the, the quote-unquote stuffed pores, which I think is a misnomer, really, um, is kind of a rudimentary partial veil. Uh, and I think that's evolved probably several times independently in the Boletales. Um, And there are a number of Boletaceae even that have um, some form of a partial veil. So um, I, yeah, I, I, I would say it's homologous at this point, but it may not you know, have the same genetic basis. Hey, everybody, just to repeat, if you go down to the bottom and you look at the reactions tab, 
you click on that at the very bottom, there's a raise hand feature. You click on that, you'll pop up in the in the chat. Bill Ewell just raised a hand. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask a question about post specificity. Uh, is there any way you would suggest that we can document uh, which lineages are associated with which host tree? Boy, this is really, really tricky. Um, I tried to publish a paper on host specificity <laughs> from my PhD dissertation, and um, Tom Bruns signed his review and basically told me no. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was right. Um, and it's because without direct evidence of the mycorrhizae, you, you can't know for certain what it's connected to. And I think there's plenty of evidence now that individual uh, individuals can be connected to more than one tree at the same time also. And that, that further muddies the water with ter in terms of host specificity. The, um, what I can say is, so it's, so I don't know how to advise you on that, I guess is the short answer, but what I can say is in Edulis, there is this really curious um, pattern of host specificity, wherein Europe, uh, it associates with every known ectomycorrhizal host. You can find it equally common on beech, oak, uh, spruce, even cystus, but in North America, it's really rare on anything but a conifer. There are a few reports of true edulis that are from cottonwood and aspen and birch. Um, but the other records that I've seen anyway from oak or beech uh, turn out to be misidentifications. And so that's a really interesting difference in the host associations between North America and Europe that we don't quite understand yet. And we're trying to we're trying to see if there is a genetic basis to host specificity in edulis and we have a number of samples that were collected in, in monotypic stands or in uh, around trees that are so isolated that they couldn't be associated with any other host. And so we do have confident host records and genomes for them. Uh, and But so far, there doesn't seem to be any genetic correlation with host in edulis. Thanks. Um, two other raised hands were Kara and Martin. Hello. So I know you were talking about primers before um, and how you're still working on that, uh, like differentiating like which ones are the best ones. Uh, do you have any that you prefer right now or like that they that are preferred and does it vary like maybe for, I don't know, for this, genera this primer works better whereas maybe a different one might work for some of the you know something that's uh more distantly related um at the moment i we don't have any um loci identified yet for resolving certain groups that is something that we're we're working on um it's um i know you're all anxious probably to get that information but <laughs> <laughs> um it's a it's slow work. It's really like, you know, one of these analyses took fifty two days running constantly on a on a big computer. So, you know, the data the size of the data sets are so huge here that um, <laughs> Tom's here, huh? Hi, Tom. Do you <laughs> um, have one you prefer? Well, we don't. We haven't identified the low size. So the thing about this so approach, there's nothing you could do, but okay. Yeah, the thing about this approach is we're pretty. Uh, ignorant of the underlying genes at this point. So okay. we just look for similarities in genes, but um, uh, we don't know what they are right now. But yeah, as I said, we are going to try to do that. So um, hopefully we'll get that info to you soon. Thanks. Uh, Martin, if you're still here. Yeah. I guess not. Speak up. Oh, Linus Kuzma has a question, apparently. Linus? Yes, hi. Am I unmuted? Yeah. yeah. Great talk, Brent. 
good to see you in person. Yeah. Uh, sort of. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Well, Andrew, like Andrew Wilson asked my first question. So I'm, you know, I'm very curious to see what, uh, since you looked at the genomes, what, what correlates specifically for trying to resolve uh, Porcini or, or other polites. But the other comment that I wanted to make was, is that I'm completely unsurprised from my own work uh, that Edulis is like one species, quote unquote, even though it's so incredibly unlike from, from like region to region. So I'm from the Northeast. I collect in Maine and in New Jersey and elsewhere. And I've collected the various, you know, you know, you know the Chippewensis and the Edulis and, you know, they all have the same, they all have the same genetic info on what I've been working. ITS, LSU, RPB1, TEF, RPB2. It's like basically other than like a, a, an occasional ambiguous position, it's the same sequence, right? So, so I'm not surprised, although I could see how people are totally perplexed uh, because they don't look the same. I've collected it in Lithuania. I've collected in New Jersey. I've collected in Maine. They all have the same sequence, right? So that's kind of bizarre to some people, but I guess it is what it is. But but I'm interested because I'm you know I you know do my own research on Anasabi, which is completely unrelated to this conference here. But but uh, but I have a number of people that I work with closely who send me bullet samples and I provide them sequences, including. Um, a project that I'm working on now with Logan Weidenfeld and some other people. So that's one of the unidentified ones that you that, that you highlighted. So I have samples of that. And Igor has provided me with samples of that in the past too. And, and we know that's an undescribed species. So so it's not really a question I'm, I'm asking. I'm just saying I really enjoyed the talk. And also I'm, we're really looking forward to if there's a better gene to look at. Uh, for these, you know, let us know, you know, give us the preprint, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, because the thing is the genes that I work with for my other work is not going to resolve the edulous group. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll just say a couple of things quickly. One is that um, it would be great if those of you who have material that you know is a new species or matches one of the things that I I showed today, if you wanted to try to describe those species, uh, either with my assistance or without, we really need names for them. It's really going to facilitate communication. Um, and I frankly just don't have the time to invest in naming species because my department doesn't value it. So um, it would be great if you could do it. <laughs> yeah, well, so 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 we'll so I'll talk to you. You know, I'll talk to you about it. I want I want to talk to the people that I'm collaborating with to make sure they're okay because I, I don't want to divulge, you know, their their information. Yeah. But 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 I'm basically, you know, providing them with sequences, but it's you know, it's more than that because I only work with select people outside of my own research interest. And so I, you know, I'll I'll clear it with them, but I definitely would like your input if they're okay with it. Well, speaking of which, Igor has his hand raised. I know you work with him. Yes. Igor, go ahead. What's your question? You have to unmute. Okay. Igor, can you unmute? Or... There you go. Yes, okay, here you go. Um, great talk, by the way. I really appreciate this. Uh, the, this is a uh, mind-boggling and uh, eye-opening experience. Uh, and I'm, it's going to take me days to digest this. Probably have to watch it a few times. Thank you very much. Um, I have two unrelated questions. Um, the first one is about Rampasterino species, which is very exciting. Um, I have an ITS sequence of that species, courtesy of Linus Kuzma. And uh, when I first blasted it a few years ago, it had no relatives. I mean, it was even difficult to imagine it was a Porcini, but you know, it, there was an indication that it was a Porcini. So I blasted it again, uh, just maybe a couple of weeks ago, and I came across an identical sequence from a specimen that was found in the Coronian spit. And that's a sandbar in the Baltic Sea near Lithuania <laughs> and uh, Poland. So my question is, how does species wind up in Europe? 
and also uh, coronian spit has been identified as a uh, entry point for the invasive species from North America of a bolete called Oribaletus projectilis that's currently mm -hmm. invading the Baltic states and Poland. So mm -hmm. could you please comment on that? That's fascinating. Um, I mean, it's entirely possible that that species is from Europe originally, but I would suspect it's not the case. I would suspect it's introduced to um, that area. Um, I don't know how it would have gotten introduced. Usually if stuff comes in on nursery stock. It's usually on the roots of the nursery plants. Um, but, you know, there is the chance of long distance spore dispersal. I can, I, we can't discount that, although I think it is super rare that that results in a, an establishment. Um, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know if I can say anything more about that. Um, Doug Martin. I think is his hand read. If he's here. Scott, I'm sorry, I have another question. Um, can I ask that right now or should I wait? Well, go, yeah, go ahead. Um, yes, um, the second question is about a, um, a new genus that was recently described from Africa. It's a guild bolete, one of the guild bolete's because there are several gen uh, genera which are dispersed across the boletaceae. So uh, apparently they evolved, you know, multiple times uh, in the history of, of, the, uh, of the family. But this one was actually a sister genus to Boletus sensus stricta or, or Boletus as we know it today. Um, can you comment on this unusual relation considering the morphology, uh, which is very, very different? Uh, the genus is called Paxilla boletus. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I, the jury's out at the moment, I would say, on its relationship to Boletus sensu stricto. Um, the study didn't have a very comprehensive taxon sampling. And so you can get spurious relationships when you, you don't have representative sampling. Um, also, it was a I think they used three genes, um, which uh, at present, those three genes do not resolve the backbone relationships with statistical support. So I think it's possible that it is related and I've seen it in our own, we have a large unpublished um, several thousand taxon three gene tree and it shows up as the sister group to Boletus in that as well. But again, um, that's with the same genes. So. I have requested the type of uh, Paxilla boletus africanus. It should be in the mail right now, and we're going to sequence a whole genome from it um, so that we can plug it into our whole genome tree. Um, Noah, Noah Siegel, can you unmute and ask? There we are. can see you. I can't hear you, Noah. All okay, right. It just wouldn't let me unmute. All right. Brandon, thanks so much for doing this talk. So I had a couple questions here. Um, you mentioned that there's, what, 14 described and five undescribed species of Boletus in North America. Where is the diversity hotspot for, for the genus? Is it Southeast Asia or is it North America? Um, it's hard to know, actually. <laughs> Uh, I think there's probably a lot more undescribed species in Southeast Asia still, just given my own work there. Um, but, you know, I think the discovery of these five undescribed species in recent years in North America suggests that there's still a lot more out there. I'll tell you where things are really interesting, where I think there might be a lot more diversity than we know about at present, and that's in Mexico and Guatemala. So that's the southern end of the edulis range. And we went down there to collect edulis from that area. But we saw a bunch of porcini that, you know, it's all like Atkinsonii complex. Um, and there's a lot of diversity down there. So I, I would say, you know, the, the, warmer, the warmer latitudes of North America uh, are, are places that I would target for new taxa. Um, and then you you mentioned Madiai and the the not wanting to touch on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean I, I I've heard the rumors for years about it being the same as Virginia's. Um, 
but I mean, so so touching a dead in fact of 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 using a a typical specimen or something as a type, and then if if that name's still legitimate or the, the botanical nomenclature rules. Um, disallow a name um, if you had anything to touch on that. You broke up there, but I think I know your question. Um, so I, I mean, there is there's uh, there's strategies to um, conserve a name or, or propose a name when it when it doesn't follow the standard rules. Um, and so this could be a case where one could choose to preserve Regenius as the name for that species and synonymize it with Madier. The standard rule would say the oldest name takes priority. And in this case, Madier is the oldest name for that species. So, you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't care either way. Maybe those of you that live in California who actually encounter these things should, should take the lead on deciding what you name it. And then on, on a broader scale, um, drawing the lines on generic concepts um, using DNA, where, where and why are you, you know, deciding to draw the lines, the nodes you're drawing them at? For instance, like Calabolitus, New Abolitus, and Sutorius um, recognize as three genera verse one. So that, so I, I, I <laughs> ignore those names for now. <laughs> um, that was just for our internal purposes, because we're trying to revise all of those names. So what I will say is my motivation for a generic classification of the Bolitaceae is that you can recognize the genus in the field without having to know the species. Now, if we could, can we achieve that? I don't know that we can without sinking everything into Bolitis again, but we're gonna try. <laughs> I didn't know, um, Ian Fairman has had his hand up for a long time. You there, Ian? Uh -huh. Hello, Ian, can you hear us? We can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Thanks so much for this. It's been really informational. Um, you had mentioned rubriceps, and then that first species um, of the unnamed ones that was from the Rockies, and it made me kind of curious because I live up in the Rockies. I live in the Northern Rockies, and um, I was finding all of these rubriceps-like um, boletes that were in lodgepole stands when I was I was looking for matsutake and stumbling across all these beliefs that were, and when I started picking them and really looking at them, the cap was darker, they were a little bit more compact, they weren't growing nearly as large. And I was curious if you know the host tree for that uh, one species of unnamed bolete in the Rockies, or um, if you've heard about this one that I'm talking about. I haven't heard of that one, so I'm definitely interested. Um, I don't know, maybe Andy has quick access to the, the records of the Maudier collections at DBG. They're all from DBG. Um, maybe he can provide some insight on the habitat. I will say there are specimens in DBG that have been called Maudier that are not this new species, that are really just edulous. So there is a little bit of confusion there at present. Yeah, and, and Rubriceps is definitely known for being able to host hop to other conifers. Um, but yeah, it's curious because I was definitely finding them in lodgepole stands and it was pretty consistent throughout the summer. It was kind of, it was a new one for me. And a lot of people on the Colorado uh, Facebook page were saying the same. So curious. If you have specimens, I don't know if you kept anything. Um, I if wish you I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe next year, if you can find them again, I would love yeah. to see them. We got yeah. it be great to nail this thing down. Thank you. Yeah. David McShane had a question, I think about sequencing. If he can appear somehow. 
hey, sorry, I'm on a, a different platform and device than usual. So I'm just having to mess with peripherals here. Yeah, I wanted to ask if you could share a little bit more about uh, your shotgun sequencing workflow for like those of us that are picking on up minions and things like that at home. Are there opportunities for us to uh, play the home game, so to speak? Um, at present, I think it's really challenging. Um, they're, you know, it's rather costly, I think, for most people to do this. Um, there are commercial companies that do the sequencing and, you know, that, you know, if you have the, the resources, you can send DNAs to those companies and they'll do the sequencing for you. But then the, the next challenge is all of the data analysis. You need to have quite, a, you know, you, it's all bioinformatics. So if you know code like bash Python, then you probably will be fine. But most people don't have those kinds of uh, skills. So I think there's multiple uh, barriers for, for most people in getting into the high throughput sequencing game. Um, and hopefully, you know, over time, those barriers will be removed. I guess it's kind of on, you know, on the shoulders of people like me and Andy and other folks here that do this kind of stuff to make make it possible for you to participate in these kinds of studies. Are the old DNA holotypes uh, getting more accessible? I know um, Dave Wadleski ran through a, a bunch of stuff with Roy on um, subville Utopies, and somebody finally cracked that and got usable DNA. Uh, is that technology advancing so that you're gonna be able to test all of these PEC holotypes someday? Yeah, I mean, I think it's arrived. It's a matter of um, technical expertise and cost. So, you know, the investment in any one specimen is quite significant using these methods. Um, so, you know, unless I've, I've tried, <laughs> I've tried to get NSF to fund a type sequencing project and they just won't do it. So until you get significant funding, it's just gonna kind of be ad hoc. Um, like it is like, you know, I'm obsessed with Porcini. So those are the ones that I sequenced. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, that there is a danger also in that because the DNA is so poorly preserved, it's really easy to get contaminants from modern samples. Mm -hmm. And it would be difficult or impossible to, to distinguish the authentic DNA from modern DNA. Um, unless you're extremely careful and you have proper controls and that kind of thing. So there is a there's some caution to consider here. What's worth, I know the people at Michigan are eager to have their all of their holes up the Smith and Deer stuff. Oh we're, we, yeah we we have them all. <laughs> and are you gonna publish the the holotype yeah. DNA so yeah. yeah yeah. Yeah I think we I think we might actually have genomes from all of them already. <laughs> that would be fantastic. We have a couple of raised hands. You want to pick one or should I? Um, yeah, you can. can. Are you able to unmute them? I think they all need to be unmuted. Oh, okay. Um, we have a follow-up from Linus. Let me ask, well, he has to unmute. Yeah, okay. Am I unmuted? Yeah, I think you I am. Unmuted. Yeah, so 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 that a comment about the subvolutopes type. Yeah, so I got that from Roy. And I, I, uh, I did my magic with Sanger. I have a whole bunch of like, you know, nested PCR techniques and all kinds of stuff. And uh, some older samples that I've gotten from Rod Tullis and other things, I've gotten them to work. But the thing is, you know, 100 year old sample, it's, 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 it's not gonna work. And the graph you showed uh, Bryn was exactly why. I mean, if the, if the, if the pieces are 100, you know, 100 base pairs, it's not gonna work even for, even one half or the other half of ITS or whatever gene. So, so yeah, I mean, that's the thing, you know, it's a shame you can't get funding to do that because that's sort of the phylogenetic, I don't know, Holy Grail is maybe overstating it, but the thing is, you know, what did the classic mycologists from the day, you know, you know what are these things that they have? And 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 I'm wondering whether uh, somebody else who was asking a question asked about minion, um, you know, which actually can read longer pieces. Of course, if there are no long pieces, it doesn't matter. But I'm 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 very very uh, eagerly following what's you know what's going to happen uh, with these old collections because 
because you know the older name takes precedent, right? So so uh, so it's very very interesting to see when people get the funds or whether technology catches up. But the but the and you know but the citizen scientists who are doing ITS or even if they're ranging beyond that to other genes, the old material they're not going to get anything from it. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, Minion, we use Minion in my lab, um, but with you know with mixed results. And I would say that technology is really finicky. Um, and most of the time it does a very poor job. <laughs> so I, I don't think people should be looking at Minion as sort of the solution to the problem. I think the technical aspects of it are really challenging. Um, to get good libraries to sequence well, we we rarely are successful in my lab, um, and we use it just to get good genome uh, reference genomes. So that long read is really essential for getting reference genomes. But in terms of just sequencing, like certainly not for old material, I wouldn't I wouldn't waste Minion on that. I don't think it's going to be useful. Um, there might okay, be applications thank you. for multi-locus barcoding with Minion, and we're looking into developing some of that. Um, but again, that had some somewhat limited value. But would, uh, an, course, would, would an organized attempt to just do epitypes solve this for you? Yeah, if if you want to abandon, you know, abandon all of the history <laughs> of these collections and just designate epitypes for everything, that that is a solution. But so far, I haven't seen the community getting behind that in a big way. So I think there are, you know, on a case by case basis, epitypes are essential, um, maybe less essential now, depending on, you know, what the condition or access to the, the type material, what that's like. But, um, you know, I think it is technically feasible to go back and, and get DNA from any existing physical material. I have, yeah, you know. You know, my, you know, my thought on this, because I work, you know, with a group here with the sub -flutopies. it's not a matter of designating the epitype is really the goal. The goal is to link the new modern collection to the old collection, because then once you have a, an epitype that you can really defend, because it's tied by some sequence data to the original type, then you can do all this other stuff. Yeah. Then you can uh, then you can sequence a genome with pretty good confidence that you're dealing with the same thing. You get your genetic surveyor stake in the ground. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Um, Richard Jacob has a question. So uh, first, I have a, a comment. You're breaking up, Richard, and you're muted. I don't think your audio is working, Richard, unfortunately. Um, how about we ask Logan? I see Brett also after. Yeah, I just I just asked Brett to unmute. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Yeah, um, I'm not more of the scientific type, but I do occasionally find myself in the Northern Boreal Forest. Uh, which parts of Central Canada were you looking at specifically? Because I'm a little more Western-ish, uh, going in mostly in Alberta and sometimes over in Saskatchewan. That's exactly Which, that's exactly what we're looking for. <laughs> okay, so yeah. uh, if I happen to find myself up there and find my find some samples, I'll be in touch, I guess. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Logan. You want to unmute and ask your question. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, thank you. This has been great. I, I had to show up a little late. I had a meeting, but um, what I caught has been fantastic and eye-opening. And um, I appreciate the time that everybody um, has put in to make this happen. Um, my question is um, really about the state of mycology, generally speaking, like you mentioned the fact that, um, you know, you have 
you have sequences of all these novel taxa and you don't have the funding or time or um, probably, um, you know, it's probably not going to help your, your, your clout as an academic to name them. So um, I guess my question is, is um, what happened to alpha taxonomy? Why is it not a priority? Why, why are professional mycologists um, less interested today in describing new taxa? Is it grant money? Is it, is it all about money? Um, and I'll just leave it there. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's partly to do with grant funding. So there's very little funding available for that kind of research. There is a little bit, but um, very little. So if you want to have a well-funded research program, you're going to have to do other things. So um, that's one reason. The other is um, most universities in the U.S. anyway, don't value that kind of research at all. So they um, they will not they will not grant tenure. <laughs> they will not hire you in the first place. Um, and then if you are hired, they will not grant you tenure or promote you for work like that. They just don't care, um, unfortunately. So that's why th that's I can't spend my time on that stuff for the most part. Other institutions do value those things, um, like museums. Strict, strictly museums and botanical gardens, those kinds of places still value that kind of alpha taxonomy, which is great. But unfortunately, those positions are few and far between, and we're also seeing them uh, being lost. So mycologists that are retiring from those positions are not being replaced. At, you know, It's not a one-to-one -one scenario at the moment. So I think a lot of the burden of alpha taxonomy is going to fall on um, People in um, in other countries, there, there's a lot of alpha taxonomy going on um, outside of the developed Western world. So I think we're going to see more and more of that in the future, and it's going to fall. The burden's going to fall on um, the, this community here. If if you can take up the charge, that's the kind of stuff that we really need. What's up? Hungry and also there used to be two cookies in the day, and now there's zero. Okay. You could go them. Go get some food. I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm um, just go get some some chips. Okay, hold on a second. I gotta deal with my daughter. I'll be back in a second. Everybody, I I'm showing only one raised hand, which is Bill. Um, and Bill, we haven't met, so I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Is, is there anybody else who has questions, or can we start winding this up? Let him get to daddy duty. It's all good. Okay. Um, Bill, would you ask your question? Yes, it's it's Bill Bakaitis. Bakaitis, okay. Yeah, uh, Lithuanian. <laughs> uh, in the 1980s and 90s, I worked with John Haynes up in Albany uh, with the pet collection. And at that time, we were interested in doing eco collections that is going to the same place where Peck collected his species and collecting new fresh species there. But as you probably know, uh, when John retired, the, uh, the herbarium sort of fell into uh, eclipse there. And not, th there's no state mycologist there now. I'm just wondering, uh, but in general, uh, is, is that attempt to go and collect fresh material from the same locations of the, of the type species? Is that, uh, is that a viable option? Yeah, it is completely a viable option. However, in, there are many cases where the type localities are so heavily modified, um, maybe with you know, feet of asphalt over them, <laughs> that it's just impossible to recollect from type localities. And things move around and, and the environment changes, the climate's changing. And so it may be that those things just aren't, aren't around where they used to be 100 years ago. So, you know, I, I think we, we have to take a practical approach here. Um, you know, I, I think it costs us, not labor not included, about $200 to sequence the genome of a type specimen. Um, and that's, you know, you're not going to do that for every type in the world, right? <laughs> 148,000 of them. Uh, I don't think that's reasonable. Um, 
So there are going to be many cases where collecting an epitype is sufficient um, and, and should be done. I think, you know, in this case, a lot of these old Porcini specimens of pecs, um, they were just so enigmatic that, you know, how are you going to go recollect something that you can't even recognize from the terse description that exists? So in that case, you know, you either say, well, we're just going to lose this name to history and we're going to ignore it completely, or we're going to spend the $200 to figure out what it is. I've decided to spend the $200 just because I'm, that's who I am. <laughs> I went down this rabbit hole and I've, you know, I, I can't climb out of it by just giving up on it, but that's probably not going to be the solution for everything. I can tell you, Bill, that we did do that for the sub Udipi's work. Um, you know, part of getting everyone and their sister to agree that that was really, truly sub Udipi's and uh, hopefully that epitype will be published soon, but it makes sense as a first step. Um, I think Doug Martin has shown up again. He still hasn't gotten to ask his question. There he is. Wonderful. Got the phone unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, you, you, this whole discussion has got the ADD brain going in all different directions. I'll try to be quick, though. Um, first off, I mean, most of my understanding of taxonomy and speciation comes from other an analogous fields like orchids, for example, where they do a lot of crossbreeding and hybridization. So I guess part one is, are you, is the science heading toward a point where you can overcome the difficulties, essentially because we're dealing with the tree diseases, if you want to view mushrooms as this, you've got to do hosts and in order to reproduce them. Um, but is, is the science heading toward a world where you can hybridize these things and see what reproduces with what to produce what results? Is that an eventual goal of the taxonomy or a side product? Um, I suppose for some people, there might be some applications where you might want to start interbreeding things, uh, particularly in the psychedelic mushroom space. And I've heard rumors of people creating hybrids of species. I haven't seen any direct evidence of that, but does it mean that it's not happening? Um, I would say that hybrids in nature are extremely rare in the mushrooms. Um, I have not detected hybrids ever <laughs> in the genetics that we've done. So I would say that that's, that's very rare and it may not be possible in many cases. Um, to do, to do it in a laboratory setting. But of course, Porcini, you can't grow very well in a lab. We do culture them. We can grow them from the sporocarps, but the spores don't germinate readily. And so um, to be able to sort of pair things and get them to hybridize in that fashion is virtually impossible. Okay, that, I, that was, I guess, the lead in to the main question of, uh, if you were looking at funding, have you considered the economics, because you've got the opportunity as a food species, and potentially a a big market um, food species. Gourmet mushrooms like these are not sold in grocery stores in the U.S. commonly, except dried. And have you considered using that as an opportunity to forward the studies a little bit, trying to find ways to reproduce these things on various, say, like truffles, inoculated roots, um, anything of that nature. We, I mean, people have tried to commercialize porcini in Europe. They've synthesized mycorrhizas and different hosts. It's just not very efficient and they don't really produce sporocarps readily. And so I think we're a long way from having yeah. anything commercial, commercially okay. viable. Um, and it's not, the thing is, we, my lab is just, we're just such nerds that we don't think about making money. <laughs> we're yeah. just so focused on this basic stuff that I guess, you know, we <laughs> maybe we should be a little more um, 
entrepreneurial yeah. about these things. I, I was just, I guess, under the under the idea on, that um, these things were easier to reproduce than they really were. I, I, I had the good fortune of stumbling into a, a wooded area, uh, probably about a half mile square. I was amazed. Uh, so variopes is, is an edgeless species, right? The, the lilac belief. And I was finding them everywhere I turned under, um, I believe they were beech trees. So I was shocked. And of course I harvested as many as I could, but this is Ohio. So um, I was kind of, I guess, shocked by the, uh, the idea that they were that scarce under hardwood. And um, I thought that they reproduced a lot more readily than perhaps they do. So, yeah, it was, it was just strange to me. I yeah, have, I think it, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, in nature, you know, I, I'm pretty sure these are really long lived individuals. So many of you probably have your spots, right? That you go back to every year and you can find Portini in the same spot every year. And I think that's because they persist for decades or longer. Um, and over time, they'll accumulate more and more resources, carbon and nitrogen resources, and can produce large quantities of large sporocarps uh, when they have access to those kinds of resources. So, um, but that's not something that, humans have been able to, to um, manipulate in, you know, under a controlled setting. And, and that's what's required to commercialize these things. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the talk. This is great. Sure. Thank yeah. you. I have Richard Jacobs question. He sent it several. He wanted to go back about the, the geographic origin for Belita's edulis. Mm -hmm. He'd mentioned something about Alaska. Yeah, um, it looks right now to us that Alaska, um, the population that's currently in Alaska, <laughs> uh, may be sort of the ancestral population because it shows more introgression. That is, it's got more DNA from all the other lineages than any of the other groups do. And that's, that's often a pattern associated with the ancestral populations. So what we think, it has happened in North America is that we've had small subpopulations break off from that ancestral population and get pushed down into refugia over and over in the last 2.5 million years from glacial um, migration. And that has resulted in um, sort of more genetic differentiation in some groups than others. Um, but that ancestral population in Alaska has retained its maximum genetic variation. Um, and then we think, we're pretty certain actually, that um, Europe is the most, is, the, is recently colonized from that um, Alaskan population. Okay. Um, we have no hands up. If anybody wants to say something, you need to do it or, or else uh, Brenda's going to head off to daddy duty. <laughs> yeah, looks to me like I think we. Oh, no, one more. Dave McShane had a, a follow up question. Uh, just a quick one. It, those of us who might like to follow up or ask questions uh, later about stuff that might not be relevant to the general audience, how uh, would we best reach out to you? I sent my email. Um, I posted my email in the chat, um, but. If you wanted, um, I don't know what the best, maybe Scott can just send, I don't know, uh, what is the best way? I mean, my email is really easy. It's brin.dentinger at gmail.com. Perfect. Uh, yeah. And if you find my lab website, it'll have my email on there as well. Um, I will warn you, I, I get, I'm inundated with email. And so I may be slow to respond. Um, and it's not because it, it has, it's not about you. <laughs> it's about my condition is I happen to be a platform architect at Hewlett Packard Enterprise on their machine learning platform and run multi-billion dollar bioinformatics experiments all the time. So wow, I'm just okay. kind of <laughs> curious and 
this is an opportunity for me to do something that's more interesting rather than like the billing services crap I deal with all day for a day job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd love to just talk and ask some more questions. Okay, uh, yeah, great. Cool. Okay, um, yeah, I know you're gonna be in Vietnam for the, what, the next month? Uh, no, just two weeks. So I leave right after Thanksgiving and I'll, I'll be there for two weeks. Okay. Um, hands up or hand, or we're gonna call it an evening. Yeah, no, uh, you know, Bryn and Scott, thank you so much for organizing this. This is really, really very interesting and, and it was a pleasure. Yeah. Me too. Thank you all for coming. Well, I, I also want to thank you, Bryn. Um, as I expected, a lot of this went over my head, but honestly, I'm going to be, uh, I'm now armed to start asking questions and learning from the people who are able to follow this. So I think you've, had a real triumph here of reaching down and educating the foraging community uh, about where your work is standing and you know, the, the things that we wanted to know. Great. Okay. Well, good night, everybody. I'm going to sign off. All right. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you all. all right. Thanks. We should do this again. I'm up for it. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Safe travels, Brent. Thanks. <laughs>